Our next speaker today is Bert, who will be talking about network services on Synthos. Thank you all for coming. All right, good morning. Sorry for the delay. Uh, uh, I upgraded my uh, my laptop yesterday evening, and uh, that was a mistake. Uh, so I mean, thank you for uh, uh, letting me borrow your laptop. All the slides are uh, the slides and, and uh, uh, all the other material is uh, online on my GitHub repository, githubcom uh, vv What you will miss today is the demo part. I had a um, uh, virtual box environment set up to, uh, to demo the principles that I was going to show, but we'll have to do without that today, sorry. So, um, my name is uh, Bent. I teach Linux at University College Ghent. Uh, Linux mainly, uh, some other courses as well. Um, a lot of the things that I code that I write or materials that I prepare, uh, I put online. You can find a lot of those on my, uh, my GitHub repository. Uh, work that I've done is um, concerns uh, writing Ansible roles, uh, scripts, other types of learning resources. If you're interested in uh, troubleshooting um, and stuff like that, I'm happy to share my uh, what I have with you. Um, so this talk is for you if you are uh, relatively new to Linux CentOS, uh, or you're, if you're still unfamiliar with the new way of working since uh, System D Enterprise Linux 7, uh, which is already uh, a while back uh, by now, uh, or if you have struggled before with uh, setting up network services on uh, on Linux, who feels uh, at least related with this uh, description? All right. <laughs> So what I want to uh, propose is to always follow a uh, bottom-up uh, approach to uh, troubleshooting, network troubleshooting. Uh, you have, uh, look at the uh, TCP IP protocol stack and uh, start at the bottom layer and work your way up. And uh, I'm going to show the most important commands to be used on uh, CentOS, on a recent version of so CentOS. Uh, if you have remarks or questions, if you think I'm uh, saying something that is not right, please do interrupt me and, uh, and ask your question. So the presentation and example code that I won't be able to show you today, unfortunately, is on the uh, Git repository for this presentation. Um, and a um, more elaborate um, you know, version of the, what I'm going to tell you here today is uh, in another repository, my uh, Linux networking troubleshooting guide. All right, but when I'm talking uh, in my talk about a uh, host system, then I mean the physical machine that runs the virtualization software, so typically uh, virtual box in the, the setup that I'm going to show. Um, a network host uh, or a host is uh, any machine with an IP address, so two, two ways of, or two definitions of the word host. Uh, the case I, um, I prepared that was you have a web server and a database server, uh, two virtual box VMs set up with, uh, with vagrants, so you can reproduce them. Uh, at your own leisure. Uh, they both have an IP address. And the server called DB has a, my, a MariaDB database uh, that works. The uh, web machine has an Apache server that does not work. And so the, the idea is to troubleshoot that one. And the uh, objective is to, at the end of the, uh, the our troubleshooting process, we can see the uh, website that is running on the Apache server. Uh, if you want to run the demo environment, uh, you clone the uh, GitHub repository uh, and run Vagrant up to set it up. It probably is not a good idea to do it over here because it will uh, pull down a virtual box base box of about uh, seven, eight hundred megabytes, uh, but you can do this at home. Uh, in order to verify that the database server works as planned, I wrote a little script that runs a, a SQL query on the, the database, which should return uh, some results. Okay, so the 
uh, the kernel of um, what I teach my students about uh, troubleshooting is to use a bottom-up approach. And look at, if you look at the TCP/IP protocols that start in the physical layer and work yourself up through the network access or link layer, internet transport and application layer. And I will explain what you need to check at each, uh, at each level. So first of all, uh, network access layer. Uh, Depends, uh, like if you're on a bare metal machine, it's important to test the cables. I've been bitten by that one quite a lot. Um, so, yeah, you usually start with uh, typing in commands, but if your cable isn't connected, that's, uh, yeah, that's all futile. Um, if you're working on a virtual machine, it's important to check the network adapter type and, uh, and settings. Um, and the, an interesting command to, to try and command line is the command IP link. Uh, IP is going to be used quite a lot in the, uh, in the process. Uh, IP link shows you an overview of the, uh, your network interfaces and whether they, there's a signal on them or not. And does this laptop happen to have VirtualBox installed? Rich. No. No, okay. sorry. Um, yeah, when you're uh, trying out the, uh, the, the, the demo environments, uh, you will notice that the virtual machines have two uh, network interfaces. Uh, one is the so-called NAT interface and the other one is a, a host only. And it's important to know, um, yeah. when you're troubleshooting, it's important to know what the settings should be. Uh, what, uh, uh, which IP addresses do you expect, uh, in what network it does, does your host uh, have to be. So it's important to understand the um, uh, networking interfaces. In the case of VirtualBox, an NAT interface uh, provides your virtual machines with a virtual, virtualized gateway uh, that gives your virtual machine access to the internet. And the uh, advantages of this is uh, this is quite reliable. If your host system has internet access, then your VMs as well. Um, also, an, another property is that the IP address that your VM gets uh, through a virtualized DHCP server is always the same. It's 10.0.2.15. And the virtual uh, router as well has, always has a fixed IP address, 10.0.2.2. Uh, and the peculiar thing is, if you uh, boot a second virtual machine with an NAD interface, it will get the same IP address. So you get two, two VMs with the same IP address. Uh, big disadvantage of uh, this uh, interface type is this is not rootable from the host system, so you cannot uh, talk to this VM uh, as a server over the, over the network. So this is not, uh, not very useful for our purposes. Uh, another uh, very popular virtual box uh, networking uh, adapter type is the so-called bridge adapter, which gives your virtual machines direct access to the physical network. And so for the network, it seems that you have three uh, hosts with uh, IP addresses within the same subnet uh, range that appear as uh, yeah, separate machines on the same network. Um, VMs are rootable from the host system. They have an uh, IP in the same subnet. Uh, internet access is, uh, is provided because of the same reason. If your host system has internet access, your VMs will have as well. But the problem with this one is uh, I, I generally um, don't recommend to use a bridge interface for, uh, for testing uh, purposes because your IP settings are inconsistent. Eh? Depending on where you are, you will get a different IP address. If you want to uh, have someone reproduce your setup, uh, yeah, the IP address will, will depend. You cannot give uh, direct instructions or, or detailed instructions. And this is something that I cannot give my students because uh, I will be confused uh, with when uh, they don't know beforehand what IP uh, settings are supposed to be. Uh, and, or even worse, and, and your virtual machine may not get an IP address from the DHCP server at all, as you may not have uh, internet. So what I usually use is a host-only interface, uh, which uh, provides virtual machines with a virtual switch. 
that connects your host system with your virtual machines. And you can add as many host-only network interfaces as you want. Uh, in this case, we will um, I'll get to the, the settings uh, later on. Uh, the advantages of the host-only network interface, it's rootable from the host's uh, system. You can communicate uh, with your VMs as if they are a server on the network. Uh, the IP settings are consistent, you can predefine the IP addresses of your VMs, uh, but the big disadvantage, you don't have internet access. And there's, a, there's no uh, gateway, uh, your host system does not function as a gateway. Um, yeah, so my setup usually uses uh, uh, one NAT interface to give your VMs uh, internet access for installations and stuff like that and a uh, host only interface for testing purposes from the host uh, system. All right, so that's a, about it for the, uh, on the network access layer. Right? So things to check, cables uh, and virtual box uh, or your own uh, virtualization platform. Uh, check the adapter type and, uh, um, and make sure that it's possible to uh, contact your VMs from the host system. And next step, uh, one step up, is the uh, internet layer. The internet layer is uh, responsible for routing and there's two things to check. Uh, one thing is the local network configuration of your machine itself and the second one is uh, routing within the local network. And in this case it's very important to know the expected values. So for the virtual box and a D network interface for example, you have to have uh, your VM should have IP address 10.0.2.15 and uh, it's uh, interesting to note that this, this is not a slash 8 network what you would expect with slash 24. Uh, the gateway is always at 10.0.2.2 and there's a DNS server at 10.0.2.3. So every VM with an NAT interface will get the same IP settings. Uh, most all interfaces, you can add them at will and you can uh, choose your uh, IP settings. Um, but if you have a clean install of VirtualBox, the first host only interface that you would create will get automatically these uh, IP settings. And I use these a lot in my, my courses as well, because that makes it easier for my students to have a, a yeah, so to speak, predictable environment to, to work in. So the host system, your physical machine, would get an IP address uh, 192.168.56.1. It's a slash 24 network. Uh, there's a virtual DHCP server that you can uh, turn on or off, uh, which is at uh, host address 100, and it will start serving uh, addresses from 101 up to 254. Uh, for our purposes over here, this is not used so often, but uh, it's interesting to know. So, uh, first step right, in the internet layer, check the local network configuration and there's three types of information you need. Your host needs an IP address and a subnet mask, it needs a default gateway to, uh, and you need to have a DNS service. And the commands that you can use to, to check this out are IPA, IP address, IP root, and uh, check out the file etcresolve.com. If you have a DHCP server, uh, those values should have been assigned automatically. Uh, so things to check, do you have an IP address? Yeah. Is it in the correct subnets? And, and uh, do you have this, the correct subnet mask? And depending on the HCP uh, or a fixed IP address, uh, and check whether your DHCP server has given you an IP address, check if the IP address is what you, uh, what you expect. And uh, configuration of um, Network interfaces can be found in etc sysconfig network scripts and then ifcrg and then the name of your interface. And on a virtual box machine, the first interface is called emp 0p 3 and the, the second one emp 0 s uh, 8 and then 9 10 uh, if you would add more. Uh, I should have included the, uh, the source of, of what this uh, config file can look like. Yeah? Uh, in the case of the DHCP uh, configuration, it usually has a setting uh, group proto equals DHCP, and that's about the only thing that you have to, uh, to 
for writing that, that config file. Uh, for a fixed address, you have um, uh, setting something like IP address and network and net mask uh, that, you, that you have to set. Uh, and that's it. So common causes of uh, IP problems: DHCP may be unreachable or won't give an IP to your uh, to your machine. Uh, if you notice uh, this type of IP address, 169.254, it's called link local or zero conf um, address. This is not common for uh, for CentOS, uh, but on some other um, some other operating systems will assign an IP address in this range if there's no uh, DHCP server. Um, if you get an IP address, but it's in an unexpected socket, maybe you've uh, you previously uh, set a fixed IP address and you have to check your, your configuration. But that's something that my students run into uh, regularly. Uh, also interesting, if you're running, I mean, if you expect an IP address to come from a DHCP server, uh, check the logs or watch the logs. Uh, uh, the command journal CTL with the option dash F, uh, follow, will, uh, uh, will show you the log files and show you what, uh, lines that are added uh, in real time. And normally you should see your machine sending a DHCP request and, uh, and you should see the conversation between your host and uh, some DHCP server. Um, in the case of a fixed IP address, we'll check the config file and, uh, and see if the settings are what you expected. Uh, so next, uh, next step in checking local configuration, IP root. Uh, should use, the first line should be uh, default via and default gateway. And yeah, sorry, I should have included the code example in, in the slides. The idea was to show this in the, uh, in the demo. Um, yeah, do you have a default gateway? Is it in the correct subnet? And in the case of the MyVMs, uh, we should expect the default gateway to be 10.0.2.2. Uh, so I have two interfaces, two network interfaces, the NAT and host only. Host only does not give you internet access, NAT does, so that should have been the, uh, the default gateway. And then the third uh, part is uh, do you have a DNS server that can resolve names uh, for your hosts? Uh, this is normally enumerated in the file etcresolve.conf. Uh, and there's a, at least one name server option that should be should be present. In the case of RVMs, that should be 10.0.2.3. Yeah. Yeah. So local configuration checking uh, consists of three parts, uh, IP address and uh, network mask, default gateway and DNS server. Uh, and then the next step is look if you can uh, reach other hosts within the local network. And so try to ping between hosts, ping default gateway and DNS, and query a DNS server to see if you actually get uh, responses. Uh, um, in this case, uh, things that I would try is from my physical machine, uh, ping the, uh, the, two, the two VMs, they were at uh, 192, 168, 56, 72 and 73, uh, I would try to ping from both VMs to my host system, which is at dot one in that subnet. I would try to ping the default gateway and the NS server. Now, remark, uh, um, for example, at our campus, all uh, routers will block ICMP traffic, so pings will never work. And so one of the uh, uh, frequently asked questions uh, of my students is, uh, sir, I tried to ping Google and it doesn't work. And my, the, my internet does work. What, what's, what's going on here? Uh, so some uh, network administrators will block ICMP, and things outside of your local network are useless. Uh, there's three examples to, to check whether DNS works. Um, if you have installed uh, the commands dig and nslookup, I think it's the name the utils uh, package in, in CentOS. Uh, you can use those. And I like dig because it gives you a lot of information. Um, uh, nslookup is also a possibility. Um, but if you're troubleshooting a uh, machine, chances are yeah, that you don't have those commands um, uh, present and you can't install them. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to uh, troubleshoot your network settings. Eh? So in that case, um, 
what you can use is the command get end uh, with option A hosts and then the, the host name. Uh, advantages of DNS lookup is that you can specify the DNS server that you want to query. Uh, yeah, I don't think, yeah, I, I should have included some code examples. Um, the commands, uh, dig, yeah, you specify the host that you name you want to resolve, and then if you want to query a specific DNS server, you type add and then the IP address of your DNS server. Um, in the case of NS lookup, it just, you just give the IP address of your DNS server as a second argument. Uh, the get and a hosts uh, variant only uh, queries the uh, DNS servers that are in uh, etcresolve.com. So it's a little bit more limited, um, but this gives you an idea yeah, if your host, whether your host can uh, use some DNS server uh, to resolve host names. And that's it for um, the part uh, checking LAN connectivity. The next step would be uh, checking routing beyond your default gateway, uh, but that's network troubleshooting beyond the scope of this, uh, of this presentation. Uh, so, uh, to summarize, internet layer, uh, check your local IP uh, configuration, IP address, network mask, uh, default gate to the DNS server, check the local uh, network, uh, ping between hosts, check whether your DN, uh, default gateway is reachable, check if DNS works. Uh, next step is the transport layer. The, the idea is for setting up a uh, network service. Uh, in this case, it's Apache that's uh, um, of interest. Uh, so on the transport layer, we're going to check the state of the um, of the HTTPD service. There's three things to check here. Is your service running at all? Is it listening on the correct ports and interfaces? And the third is, uh, are your firewall settings correct? The first command, systemctl uh, status, will give you, uh, will tell you whether the service is running. So in your output, you will get, you will see it uh, either active running, which is a good thing, or inactive dead, which means it's uh, not running. And so try to start it up with systemctl start httpd. Uh, if it fails, you have to check the configuration, and that's uh, something we'll look at in the application layer phase. Um, also something to check is whether the service is enabled or disabled. Uh, if not, you should enable it, which means that it will be uh, started at boot time. Um, next step, uh, it's also important to check whether your service is configured to run, uh, to listen on the correct ports. Uh, traditional command to, to check this out is netstat, but in, pre in recent versions this has been uh, replaced by uh, SS. And uh, netstat is still available, I think, in the... Uh, I don't remember, Net Tools package, I think. Uh, SS may be available from a default minimal installation. Um, SS is also um, implemented in a different way, and that's, that is, as far as I understood it, from, from my lab, or the read about it, is grabbing the proc file system, while SS uses uh, actual system calls to, to get the necessary information. But the, uh, if you know NetStats, the uh, options for SS are also probably known. Uh, the option dash T will check for TCP ports. The L for listening ports, so server ports. This is what we will need for setting up a network service. The N will show you port numbers instead of the service names. And the P option will show you the process behind the um, that is listening on that, that specific socket. Uh, when you use the P option, you need to uh, have administrator uh, rights or root rights, so you add sudo or login as a root user. Uh, the same, something uh, similar for a UDP service like DNS or something like that. Uh, check the U. Uh, uh, um, if you don't remember what the port numbers 
the expected port numbers are there's a cheat sheet uh, installed on your Linux system in EDC services, which enumerates all port numbers and service names, which is, uh, can be uh, interesting to check. Um, and then finally, what's also important to check in the output of SS, and again, sorry for not including uh, some output, um, but SS will show you what interfaces it's listening on. Uh, so there's a column uh, that ends with a colon and then a port number, uh, AD in the case of our HTTP server, or what we expect. Um, but before the colon, is the um, it will specify the interfaces it's listening on. In, um, so you would expect uh, um, a service that is available for your users to listen on all interfaces and you should see a star in front of it, uh, so star uh, colon uh, 80 for example, or the IPv6 equivalent is a double colon, uh, colon colon, and then the uh, uh, colon that separates uh, interf uh, uh, interface and, and port number and uh, the, the port number itself. Uh, some services are um, the, the, the standard installation, default installation, will only listen on the loopback interface, and that's something that uh, is overlooked uh, sometimes. In that case, you would see 127.0.0.1 colon 80, for in the case of an HTTP server, and, or the IPv6 equivalent, uh, double colon 1 colon the, uh, the port number. So, is the service running? Second thing, is it listening on the correct ports and interfaces? And the uh, last one, are your firewall settings correct? And the firewall settings should allow um, uh, traffic to the specified sockets or ports. Uh, on recent versions of, um, of CentOS and since Red Hat 7, the command to um, manage your firewall settings is firewall CMD and no longer ID tables. The command list all will, I mean, the option list all will, uh, will show you the, uh, the settings. The, it's a little bit different the way it's, it's organized, uh, if you're still used to the IP tables uh, settings. Uh, basically, firewalls, the, the firewalls are, um, but you can uh, create several lists of rules that you can apply in uh, different situations. For example, if I, uh, I could install uh, rule sets for my laptop when I'm at home, or when I'm at work, or when I'm sitting in a coffee shop, or a public place. And these are called zones in uh, Firewall D uh, nomenclature. In the case of a server that's in a fixed network, you usually don't have to uh, create zones. There's a one zone that is activated by default, it's called the public zone. And the, this command, uh, sudo firewall cnd list all, will show you the uh, rules that are defined in that public zone. Uh, there's two ways, I mean, two easy ways uh, to add uh, rules with the option add service, and then you specify the name of the service, for example, HTTP, in the case of a web server. And uh, there's a, the other one is add ports, and you specify the port number and transport protocol. Uh, uh, for example, AD slash TCP. Um, so this is how I would uh, activate the, or activate uh, firewall rules for the uh, Apache web server. Uh, the option permanent uh, ensures that when you reboot your machine or uh, restart the firewall, that the rule is still present. Uh, the, fire, the reload option here, the or commands in the third line, um, is necessary because if you specify the permanent uh, option, your change is not uh, executed immediately. If you uh, leave the permanent option out, it will apply your change immediately, but it will get lost after the after the release. <coughs> Uh, and I'll, I also uh, recommend to, if possible, use the add service uh, option if the service that you're setting up is supported. And you can uh, get a list of supported services with firewall cmd dash dash get dash services. It gives you a long list of uh, whatever is in uh, uh, 
uh, whatever can be specified with the add service option. And if those uh, three things, uh, is your service running? Is it listening on the correct uh, sockets and interface? And is your firewall uh, correct? Then at that time, your service should be uh, accessible or uh, available for users on the, on the network. Uh, the next step would be to check if the configuration of that service is uh, is correct. Now, this um, is becoming application dependent, so I can only give some general um, recommendations. Uh, check the logs with journal CTL, because uh, that's where uh, error messages will, um, will be shown. Uh, there's usually a command to check the config file syntax. Uh, and try to use client tools to access your uh, service over the network. In the case of uh, Apache curl, uh, there's, uh, or SMB client for a Samba server and so on. Uh, um, I usually uh, open a separate terminal window where I open the log files uh, with the option dash F, so follow the, the log files, and you can select the service that you're your troubleshooting at the time with the dash u uh, option. Um, some services still uh, put uh, text in the var log uh, directory structure. Uh, for example, uh, if you're uh, checking a PHP application, the PHP related errors would be in uh, still in var log httpd error log. So you would need to check both. Uh, so there's usually uh, uh, commands for checking config file sy syntax, uh, Apache CTL config test in this case, and test par in the case of Samba, um, namely check conf in the case of DNS and so on. And uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, so most of my students, when they get into trouble, they're googling uh, uh, stuff, but at a certain point, if you want to uh, yeah, really get into uh, things, it's uh, it's important to read the, the actual manual of the system that you're, uh, you're working on. Um, so I try to recommend my students to read the Red Hat manuals, in, in, uh, especially the System Administrator's Guide, Network Geeking Rights, and as a leading site. I think they're very well written, and there's a, a team that, that does a lot of effort to, to keep it up to date. Who reads these things? All right, that's half, about half of the of the room. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, man pages of the config files also have some useful information. I usually look them up online because uh, I don't usually install man pages on, uh, on servers, but uh, they're on, uh, available online as well. I'm going to skip the as a Linux uh, uh, part because I'm, I, I see that I'm almost out of time. And if you're interested, you can look at the, uh, the examples and, uh, and check it out yourself. So I'm going to finish up with some general guidelines. Um, maybe a good idea when you're uh, changing config files uh, to back them up before you're uh, starting your troubleshooting process. And um, another important one is be very systematic. Uh, don't skip steps, but really try to follow the bottom-up approach. Uh, because uh, if you leave an error on a... For example, the internet layer, then it's futile to, to try to solve uh, mistakes on the, on the transport layer because your service will not be available over the network. Uh, don't skip steps uh, and uh, never make assumptions about your system. And your troubleshooting is important to test every little, uh, every little thing. It's important to know your environments, what are the expected values, and uh, Read your log files and, and ensure that you can interpret what is, uh, what is written there. Uh, this is uh, from a tweet from Chris Buitart, I think, yesterday or a few days ago, which is perfect for this. Uh... Read the error message. Uh, the, uh, I uh, get a lot of emails, it doesn't work, please help me, but uh, when you don't say what, what is the error message, it's... yeah. You, because you have no idea what you're, you're looking at or what, uh, what may be the, the problem. Error message can give you uh, a shortcut in the uh, bottom-up approach. And if you're, the error message suggests that it's something on the transport layer, then maybe it's not needed to check all the stuff on the internet layer that below. 
Um, yeah, what I do uh, often is open a log file in a separate terminal uh, with the follow uh, option, so I can see what happens. And when I restart the service, I can see what happens in the terminal, I can see uh, error messages. Uh, work in small steps uh, and test every, uh, every step along the way. Uh, use the uh, commands to validate uh, syntax. And don't forget to reload uh, the service when you change the config file. Um, and to ensure that your changes are successful, uh, run the command again to check what, uh, what was the problem. Uh, I think it's also a good idea to keep a, a cheat sheet or checklist uh, with uh, the process that you use a lot or commands that uh, you tend to forget. Uh, I compiled a few myself, uh, which is, I think, one of my most popular uh, GitHub repositories. You know, let's see, look at the stars that it gets. And maybe stop uh, if you're um, uh, managing servers manually. Maybe it's time to uh, automate uh, things with a configuration management system, which will uh, ensure that mistakes that you made previously won't be repeated. Um, yeah, it may also be a good idea to automate your tests. Uh, I have uh, put a link to um, a test script that I use in one of the assignments that I give uh, my uh, that I give my students. That's why I, one of the assignments my students have to perform is set up uh, a uh, yeah, small network with virtual machines uh, and uh, to validate whether they have done that correctly, I ri I've written some uh, tests using the Bash uh, automated testing system or BATS uh, testing framework. Uh, you can click through and uh, take a look at uh, what I did there. And finally, never ping Google. There's too much uh, things that can go wrong if you ping Google. So if it doesn't work, it gives you no information whatsoever about what's uh, what's going on. So be more thorough and and, and follow the. Uh, the checklist. Uh, that's it. Um, maybe I can finish off with showing you the my uh, Linux network troubleshooting guide. It has uh, my uh, too long didn't read checklist uh, that gives you all the commands that I have presented in the uh, in, in the slides on the, in the short list, uh, internet layer, transport layer, and so on. Oh, thank you for listening. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, contact to me in the in the hallway.